Dr. Zirma, Agnes, friends, attendees, and honored guests, Dr. Barbara Goldstein and I join with the membership of the NES organization to congratulate Dr. Agnes Mira, new president of the NES, associate professor of the Semmelweis University Faculty of Medicine, Budapest, Hungary, Department of Otorhinolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery, and her team here in Budapest, Hungary. A special thank you for the courtesies extended to us, both to present a video at the 43rd Congress of the neuro Otological and Equilibrometric Society in Budapest, Hungary, which is taking place here between the 26th and the 28th of May of this year. We wish you and your team here in Budapest at the Semmelweis University Faculty of Medicine here in Budapest, good health, and to achieve the goals that you have set for the NES and each other. The title of the talk that I'm presenting today is EEG-based brain function, imaging, and tinnitus. The clinical implications and doing that in the form of a case report. Last year we presented a case report of a soft failure in a cochlear implant case using data from nuclear medicine, PET imaging of brain, and also EEG-based function imaging and tinnitus. Today, the title of this talk, together with my co-presenter, Barbara Goldstein, will tend to focus primarily on the technique itself of EEG-based brain function imaging and tinnitus and its clinical implications. I have no disclosures at this time we are now following the Declaration of Helsinki. We are in compliance with ethical and moral criteria which recommend human investigation research. We have no disclosures. The goals of this talk are to objectivize a subjective auditory complaint tinnitus, to identify the tinnitus signal, that is to establish an electrophysiologic correlate for tinnitus, to improve the accuracy of the tinnitus diagnosis, that is the clinical type of tinnitus, and to provide data of brain function as an adjunct to a tinnitus plan of relief, targeting treatment for individual for each tinnitus patient. And lastly, to present a system that attempts to monitor and can show monitoring of the efficacy of a given tinnitus relief plan of treatment as reflected in auditory and non-auditory brain functions. The presentation will include an introduction asking the question, why should you or anyone in the audience perform EEG-based functional brain imaging networks. Thirdly, to present the basics of EEG-based functional brain imaging networks, to present the method that we use, namely neurometrics, to present a case report, discussion, then conclusions and take-home messages. The introduction to the basics of brain function imaging include, firstly, what I asked, why should we be performing this? First, all features are extracted from an artifact-free EEG which have been transformed relative to age expected normal values and they are expressed in units of probability, that is, where plus or minus 1.96 is at the P less than 0.05 level of significant deviation from normal for their age. Secondly, to identify the source localization of the maximal abnormality in the very narrow band frequency spectra which show the mathematically most probable underlying sources of the scalp recorded data to be greatest in a particular region or regions of interest, that is, to demonstrate functional connectivity and functional localization in brain in a particular individual tinnitus patient. Thirdly, to present a table of the regions of interest that you will see in source localization, which is in the range of z-scores expressed in units of probability where plus or minus 1.96 is at the P less than 0 0.05 level and plus or minus 2.54, that is, at the P less than 0 0.01 level of significant deviation from the normal age of the patient in the database. That is, it reflects the functionality of brain connectivity and localization. Secondly, here are the answers. EEG-based brain function imaging network is recommended, first, to obtain visualization of multiple brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal for an individual tinnitus patient. Secondly, to identify the relationship between ear brain structure and function in a tinnitus patient. 
the data to be used as an adjunct to the clinical evaluation of the tinnitus patient in order to establish an accuracy for the tinnitus diagnosis and its treatment. What is brain function imaging? Functional brain imaging is a study of human brain function. It is based on data analysis obtained from application of multiple technologies which provide brain imaging. And this is the reference of those professionals who then gave this title and this definition. The aim is to understand how the brain works in terms of its physiology, functional architecture, and dynamics. The data from functional brain imaging is presented in a numerical and visual display of images which reflect the correlation between structure and function. Brain function technologies are multiple. They provide three-dimensional imaging visualization of the brain for that which we are now trying to investigate. In this case, we're talking about tinnitus. These technologies include, firstly, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, which provides functional connectivity of MRI as well, which is a special technique of functional MRI. And in case, in both, you have blood oxygen dependency, which then establishes neuronal connectivity. Secondly, the technology of magnetoencephalography, MEG, where magnetic fields are identified in brain, the patterns of which are then used to identify that which now we are interested in at the moment in time. Here we're talking about tinnitus. Thirdly, we're all very well acquainted with nuclear medicine imaging using SPECT, single photon emission tomography, or PET, positron emission tomography, focusing here on metabolic changes which take place in brain. And now we have here for the discussion today, EEG-based brain functional imaging. That is electrophysiology in brain, EEG, which is based on identification of regions of interest, which now are able to identify that similar in visualization to what we see with nuclear medicine or magnetoencephalography. We use the techniques of QEG, that is quantitative electroencephalography, and combination with Loretta, low resolution electromagnetic tomography. We speak of S and E Loretta, standard and exact. And lastly, the technology of functional near infrared spectroscopy, FNIRS. What is now EEG based brain functional imaging? How do we define that? Brain functional imaging of brain speaks of images of raw EEG data transformed relative to the mean and standard, that is, Z transformed, mathematically determined to have varying levels of statistical significance for standard deviations from a normative age-based population. Secondly, all metrics of evaluation are expressed in units of probability, that is, where plus or minus 1.96 is at the P less than 0.05 level of significant deviation from normal for age. Thirdly, the statistical analyses of the data, the neurometrics analysis, is to be used as an adjunct to the clinical evaluation of the patient. Quantitative EEG is nothing more than a spectral analysis of the raw EEG data. Loretta, low frequency resolution electromagnetic tomography analysis, provides source localization in 3D. We see the identification of the maximal abnormality in the very narrow band frequency spectra that shows where the mathematically most probable underlying sources of the scalp recorded data is greatest. The regions of interest based brain function imaging, table of z-scores, are reflective of functionality of brain as well as differentiation between auditory and non-auditory regions of interest. We speak of electroencephalotinidography, ETG. What is it? It's a term that we're using to identify the clinical term for application of EEG-based brain functional imaging for identification of multiple brain functions, auditory and non-auditory, in the presence of the tinnitus of all clinical types. We consider that the ETG is clinically considered analogous in its clinical application to the EKG for cardiology in the 1930s. So this is for tinnitus what now the EKG was for cardiology in the 1930s. When I spoke to you last year, I presented some basic information on EEG 
some of which I'm repeating at this time. Firstly, we're using the 1020 system for placement of electrodes. On your right, with the even numbers, are that electrode site on the right side, and the odd numbers are on the left. And one can see here the frontal areas, we see here the middle areas, and we see here the parietal areas, and we see here now the occipital areas. Significant for us are the temporal areas, T3 and T5, as well as also parietal you'll be seeing, and the central areas, be it from the frontal or in these areas, CZ and PZ. The QEG is a spectral analysis, I've said, of the raw electrophysiologic data of the electroencephalogram, measure that is quantified for the frequencies of response in brain and displayed in multimetric topographic maps, that is, power, asymmetry, relative power, coherence, and phase. The frequencies of the response are reflective of multiple brain functions in response to the input that is presence of an external or internal sensory stimulus. The sensitivity of the QEG is more sensitive, that is, in milliseconds, than the nuclear medicine PET or SPECT, which are in minutes or hours in the temporal domain. It's not specific. Correlation of the data with the clinical history and physical exam is required to establish its clinical significance. QEG provides an objective measure for display in brain of the efficacy of treatment of different modalities attempting tinnitus relief. It can serve as a monitor to determine treatment efficacy. Important is that the QEG is a technical report of brainwave activity. Abnormalities can be detected in the measurements. It is not a mass screening test. Clinical significance can be established for a particular diagnostic category by correlation of the measurements with a discriminant function analysis. This test, QEG, is sensitive but not specific for any diagnostic category. The data provides an adjunct function for establishment of an accuracy for the tinnitus diagnosis its medical significance, and the selection of treatment. Here are the definitions briefly that I'll go over, which I did last year. I've included it in this video, so whoever looks at it does not have to look back in time to see what the definitions are. The power spectrum. In EEG, the power density spectrum or power spectrum is a common method for EEG quantification. The word power does not have meaning of distributed power in an electrical circuit. The power spectrum density is a function of frequency. The dimension of the power spectra is intensity per bandwidth. The signal dimension is in microvolts. Relative power speaks of a measure of the relative distribution of the electrical activity over the different frequencies of brainwave activity, called delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Whether there's a difference between one side or another speaks in its asymmetry. A significant degree of activity between into or within cerebral hemispheres it can be global or localized for a given frequency of brain activity. The phase, a measure of the lead or lag of shared rhythms between two regions. Coherence, a frequency contingent cross-correlation measure, indexing the amount of shared activity between two scalp regions. Functionally, the coherence reflects the connectivity between regions. We have a new term to keep in mind, a connectome. That means a map of neural connections in brain. We have here a new discipline called connectomics, the study and production of connectomes. And that's what we have here now in the EEG base issue. We have here now how different structures connect one with another, the unit being the nerve. And we then have here multiple connections in various parts of the brain itself the science of which is known as connectomics. EEG databases are very significant. In our early work starting in 2000, we were using the Lexicor database for all our data analysis of QEG. Since 2006, 2008, we have now been using the database provided by the Brain Research Lab at NYU. These frequencies of brainwave activity are roughly speaking Delta from 1 to 4 hertz. From theta, from 4 to 8 hertz. Alpha from 8 to 14, 13 hertz. We speak of a beta, 
above 13 cycles, usually 14 to 40, or beta 1. And that would be from now 13 to about 25. And then beta 2 or gamma, which would then be above 35 to 40. What is the method that we're using? We speak of neurometrics. I was pleased to find a definition for this in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And that is the quantitative study of the electrical activity of the brain and nervous system. It is a method to identify and diagnose neuropsychiatric disorders based upon the patterns of brainwave activity. Imagine, this to then be proposed by Roy John in the 1960s, saw the light of day in science, and then was published again in 1977 as neurometrics, clinical applications of quantitative EEG. And now seeing the light of day again as we speak in terms of brain functional imaging using EEG-based data for identification of regions of interest, which now have then identification in relation to functional connectivity and functional localization. Here we see here now the, the electrodes, as I mentioned to you earlier, and the electrodes are placed in these positions, 10, 20 position, and 20 minutes of recording are done of the resting EEG. And these are then followed by the fast Fourier transformation and feature extraction, which includes the following metrics of evaluation. Measures of power, absolute, relative, and mean frequency. Intra and interhemispheric relationships between regions, that is, to establish the connectivity between them. And here we have the brainwave activity in frequencies. And next, source localization. What do we mean? We mean that that which we now have, by placing electrodes on the skin of the scalp, we don't know where the potentials that we're now, now obtaining, where do they come from? This technique, source localization, tells us where in brain the potentials coming from skin-placed electrodes are coming from. It identifies the mathematically most probable underlying sources of scalp-recorded data using very narrow frequency spectra. Very important. The source localization tells us the mathematically most probable underlying sources of scalp-recorded data using very narrow frequency spectra, which I'll be showing to you. And what's the first step? Well, the first step is that all the extracted features are transformed to Gaussian. Most are simple log transforms. The second step, the Z transformation relative to age expected normal values that express the probability that subjects value lies within the normal range for their exact age. And then the neurometric QEG norms, most important, the database, which is then existing for ages six to 90 from age six to 90 years have been published and demonstrated to be culture fair and to have high test retest reliability. And the potential effect of age on changes observed in the EEG is removed by describing the individual's EEG features in terms of deviations from age expected normal values using Z scores. There can be an objection because the focus upon Z scores some can complain that this is a univariate analysis, which allows one to overemphasize and overinterpret the result that one is then reporting upon. However, here we are in 2016, a technique that's been introduced down the line in the 1960s, and we find that we need to do this in order to be able to have observation to the limits of what it has for giving us now information of brain function in general. What are the z-scores? These are observed scores transformed into a score with a common reference, that is, a probability value. The z-mean is zero. The standard deviation for z is plus or minus one. For the QEG raw power transformed into a z-score is then placed against a normative database, as I mentioned to you from the Brain Research Lab at NYU, which is corrected for age and other factors. Thirdly, the QEG power score with a value greater than plus or minus 9.6 would significantly differ at the 0.05 level from the mean of the age adjusted norm. That is two standard deviations having a 95% confidence level. 
The functional brain imaging that we see is three-dimensional. And we see it, as I mentioned just earlier, with different technologies. We see it, be it the data coming from PET or SPECT in terms of metabolism. We see it coming from magnetoencephalography, focusing upon that magnetic field. We see it also with functional MRI by seeing differences in blood oxygen level dependency. And we see it now also with Loretta, low frequency resolution electromagnetic tomography analysis. The goals in this technique are to have source localization. That is the mean activity of single voxels of activity superimposed onto a normal MRI template with coordinates of normal brain cortex. It is for the identification of not only functional neuronal connectivity, but also is here now source localization, functional localization. The QEG, quantitative EEG, is a spectral analysis I've said a few times of the raw EEG data. Now, low resolution brain electromagnetic tomography also has had exposure to variable resolution brain tomography called Veretta. Both are similar in approaches. It's based upon the hypothesis that there are visualization methods. Each one provides methods of visualization of neuroanatomical regions that are the probable source generators in brain of changes on the surface EEG activity. And they are clinically reflective of the clinical course of the tinnitus and response to treatment. The goal compares favorably with more classical functional imaging methods as PET, SPECT, and fMRI. And here's the advertisement available to each and every one of you at no cost on the internet. S being standard Loretta and E being exact Loretta, having a zero error in its identification since 2002 with modification along the way. So this is available to all of you to avail yourself of it and then applying it as we're recommending for your tinnitus cases. The clinical research in this came from the NYU lab. It was headed by Roy John, who has left us since 2009, Leslie Pritchard, its director, and Robert Eisenhardt at that time. The EEG always has presented a problem to those using it, and that is how to compute images in 3D of electrical neural activity in brain based on extracranial recording measurements, that is, to identify the source generators in brain. The non-uniqueness of the solution to this inverse problem has always been a limitation of the extracranial EEG MEG measurements and many distributions of generators. In other words, most of the time we know where something is coming before we get the result. Here we're getting the result and we don't really know where it's coming from. And that is where this got the term, the inverse problem of the EEG. But ongoing research has brought up the Loretta and Veretta, as I mentioned to you. And the references are here, as you see in the slide. And I mentioned them to you. Pa Roberto Pasquale Marquis, involving with the Loretta, and Bosch Bayardi, and so on, from Cuba, who came up with a 3D statistical parametric mapping of EEG source spectra by means of a variable resolution electromagnetic tomography known as Veretta. We've been using Loretta, not Varetta. A word now about source localization. Source localization of the scalp recorded EEG has increased our ability to understand this entire technique. And it's obtained from the quantitative analysis of the raw EEG data. This method of signal processing is a solution to the inverse problem I just presented of trying to localize the mathematically most probable source of voltages that we are recording from the scalp. For ages 6 to 90, 0 0.5 to 50 hertz norms exist for each cubic voxel. For each voxel, an individual's values are compared statistically to the expected norms for their age, just as is done in neurometric analysis. Statistical significance of each voxel is encoded in color, superimposed upon slices from probabilistic MRI atlas. Lastly, the anatomical accuracy of the QEG source localization has been repeatedly confirmed by co-registration 
or other brain imaging modalities. And now for our case report. I bring up the case of a tinnitus male age 41 with tinnitus in his right ear, concentration and occasionally in the left. The quality was a high pitched hiss, whistle, high tension wire, a questionable second sound or modulation of the hiss, and he had a somatocentric component in the face, jaw, and neck. The noise was said to be moderate severe to include interference in sleep, concentration, communication, task performance, and social activities. The associated complaints were multiple, include a hypercusis, ear blockage, more right than left, increased tinnitus intensity with pressure application of the forehead and clenching of the jaws, the somatocentric component, weight loss, more than 30 pounds, interference in speech expression and memory, cervical headache, discomfort, tightness in the neck, no complaint of interference and balance to the time we saw him initially, which was in December 2014. The headache being parietal, temporal parietal, more right than left, and also the neck. Significant in every tinnitus case, and particularly demonstrated in this patient, are the multiple comorbidities. Not only that of the tinnitus, but severe anxiety, depression, and very important, the clinical history of head trauma in January of 2014 obtained with skiing. The clinical history is considered to be essential in every tinnitus patient. We now sometimes spend more than two hours with each tinnitus patient in order to establish an accurate clinical history. And keeping in mind that we saw this patient initially in December of 2014, and he had a ski accident in January of 2014, this was not uppermost in his mind. And therefore, he focused primarily on when the tinnitus started, which was when he was exposed to the exhaust of a racing car. And other comorbidities included history that was suggestive of a presumed idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Hypertension. He had chronic nose sinus disease, and very important, a cervical radiculopathy bilaterally. The diagnostic procedures that we recommended included an MRI of the brain, which was reported normal. He also had mild paranasal sinusitis, and we did the Fukuda stepping test, which showed him to be circling to the left. He also had an MRI of the head done in January of 2014, which was reported normal, and the tinnitus evaluation. Conventional auditometry was done from 250 to 8,000 cycles. The ear right showed a normal peripheral hearing sensitivity between 250 and 8,000 cycles. The ear left showed normal peripheral hearing as well, but only till two, <coughs> between 250 and 4,000 cycles. That is a mild loss of hearing at 4 and 8K. And if we stopped at this point, we would think that this hearing was not too significant. But when we do the ultra high frequency testing between 10 and 20 <coughs> kilohertz, there there's a central hearing loss greater than expected for the age of the patient. The masking curve was a type one, which meant the patient should do well with a masking device. And his loudness discomfort level interestingly revealed no hypocusis even though hypocusis was positive in the clinical history. The tinnitus diagnosis was of a subjective idiopathic tinnitus, ear right predominantly of a central type, with a cochlear and somatosensory components, subclinical in the ear left, which means he spoke of it mostly in the right ear, but we felt it was already in the left ear. And the clinical course in the future as we went along with the patient had its manifestation as we predicted. And he had a history of the hypocusis. So now what is this report that we get when we send the patient? What information do we get that seems to help us for what I say? Not that we're seeing tinnitus, but we are seeing multiple brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal. And here's the information that we get. First, the neurometric Z images, which I'll be showing you momentarily. These are Z-score topographic maps. When you look at it, the nose is up, Left is on the left side, color coder for significance of deviation from age, normal values. It is a Z plus or minus three with a P value less than 0 0.01. Four, the evaluation metrics of absolute power, relative power, asymmetry, and coherence. And then the narrow band spectrum. That means in the band of frequencies that we have for a given brainwave activity, we want to see where, if at all, 
there is a particular brain frequency in the narrow band of this large band that now is more active than otherwise should be. And you will see a cursor and color image at the maxima frequency. And then measures of cortical connectivity. Remember the definition. Shared electrical activity between electrodes and between hemispheres. Each image summarized below that I'll show to you shows the results for the coherence between the labeled region and all other regions in the labeled band of total for all delta, theta, alpha, beta, and beta 2, color-coded by significance level using a z-scale shown where plus or minus 3 is a probability of a p-value less than 0 0.01. Next, there are numerical, numerical tables of QEG tabular data from each of the 10 to 20 electrode sites. The bipolar power for absolute power, relative power, asymmetry, and coherence. These tables of z-scores, color codes by significance of deviation from age expected normal values, where black, wherever you see black, means it's within the normal limits. And where you will see blue, a significant deficit, and red is a significant excess. And then the source location image, localization images. And lastly, what I've asked to be done, to put together a list of all the regions of interest in brain that are activated. And one can see a ranking based upon z-scores of that which is mostly now statistically significant in the activation that we're seeing. And here they are. What you're looking at first, where well, you see my cursor, that was done initially when the patient saw us in December 2014. And here, alongside what was done six months later. What you notice here is the absolute power, which shows here now that there is here a underactivity in the total thing as well as also in the data for the delta, theta, alpha. It's mostly here in the posterior regions. Interesting here with respect to the story he gave of the head injury. And also an area borderline in beta and beta 2 in the central areas. And when we have here for the relative power, it lights up three standard deviations in the middle of leads. There is an asymmetry here in the occipital area as well as also in the frontal area. And we're noticing here an asymmetry here in the area that we would think having to do here with the precuneus. And when we take a look at the coherence, there is hot in the area of the frontal, the central, and also parietal areas. When we're taking a look here now six months later, everything is black, pretty much so, which means there's very little statistically significant information with the exception of what we see here in the beta range in the central lead. And if we take a look here the next, in looking for the narrow band maxima, we're seeing that that is here now at 24.2 hertz initially, and that area here now shifts from 24.2 to 23.8, but it is now reduced. So even though there seems to be a reduction in the overall activity in brain, there is here now in this illustration, what I'm showing here with my cursor, these are each of the electrode sites. And I asked for this to be done so that we would see not just that which is maximal here in the central lead that you see here in red, but I have it here now that I can see along the entire range of now frequency from plus or minus zero to 20 and from zero to 20, 40 hertz. So therefore we have an understanding of what is going on in time for all brain function activities at the same time. Here we have a cursor, which is, here we have the cursor showing you the standard deviations and also the z-scores. The way you see it to be here in yellow and in red are respectively three and two standard deviations. And here are the images. These are images of source localization, which then show us that there is here posteriorly in the area which would be about the precuneus, that area that now is seemingly hot. And we have here also in the central lead, areas here involving the area of the cingulate. And 
If you take a look at the areas that he had initially, comparing to where it was before, you notice how there is here now an increase that he now is describing, particularly here in the central leads, as well as also here in the frontal leads, and also involving both hemispheres. If we take a look at the table of Z values initially, what you see here in red has a statistical significance better than 1.96. And therefore, these are the significant areas, even though it lights up for all these additional regions of interest in the source localization. And if we take a look six months later, what we see is that these areas that are lighting up are pretty much the same. That having to do with the mid-singulate, the precuneus, right and left, and the singulate. But here's the addition, the information here of the chordate, both right and left. And this is important. It is known that the chordate is targeted for emotional trauma. And this fits with the increased clinical observation and report that we have of the increased anxiety that the patient has. Significant in this table of Z-scores is that we have relatively no significant activation of auditory regions of activity, which one would expect in a patient complaining bitterly of the tinnitus. And that explains to us that we need to respect that which we have learned is existing for every sensation. Every sensation has different components. The sensation itself, the behavioral emotional component, and that having to do with the psychomotor, how the patient expresses itself materially, that which the patient's experienced for a given sensation, whatever it may be. And that applies here to tinnitus, an aberrant auditory sensation called by us tinnitus. Here now are some of the readings of interest that we have to pay attention to. I show you here the area of the precuneus. That is important with respect to that area that we're now seeing with respect to memory formation. And now the prefrontal cortex. Here is the area of the prefrontal cortex that we're talking about. But in particular, we find that no other modality is more frequently represented in the prefrontal cortex than the auditory. But the role of auditory information in prefrontal functions is not yet well understood. I recommend to all in the audience to avail themselves of this publication that just appeared in 2014 of the investigators Helen Barbas and an individual to remember started her work in 1997 in animal models. And this is work that she's now done in the rhesus monkey. And what it is showing here is that the frontal polar area 10 is the main frontal auditory field as the major recipient of auditory information in the frontal lobe and the chief source of output to auditory cortices. Area 10 is thought to be the functional mode for the most complex cognitive tasks of multitasking and keeping track of information for future decisions. So we're talking here not about a single particular problem, tinnitus. We're talking here about multiple brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal, an aberrant auditory sensation. And these patterns in this prefrontal area suggest that auditory association links of area 10 are critical for complex recognition. It is then premature to look at a given study of brain and think that that is tinnitus. No, remember the definition for these brain functional imaging technologies, and that is identification of multiple brain functions in the presence of a tinnitus signal. And here you see her work in the monkey. And you notice this is area 10, and this is the area that we have the issue of the primary auditory cortex A1. LF is here now the sylvan fissure. And you notice the input from area 10 into the superior surface layer of the superior temporal gyrus. Multiple areas of association auditory cortices, which now respond in turn. And the more dense the arrow, the greater is the input to area 10. And we then also have areas besides area 10. And this is important to keep in mind when we're seeing our tinnitus patients. And the area here on the sagittal section of the brain, 
and that is of the medial prefrontal cortex. There is a dorsal and a ventral. A dorsal and a ventral medial prefrontal cortex. These structures are critically important in decision making. And when choices were made based on the advice from another person, activity in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex reflects a prediction error for the accuracy of the advice that was given to the patient to make their decision. Interestingly, when one now has predictions about the behavior of others, these so-called so simulated reward prediction error signals were found in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Consider our tinnitus literature, which has a high degree of association of the nucleus accumbens with that of the medial prefrontal cortex. And this is an area of investigation that we need to do now for our tinnitus patients. Not that we're seeing tinnitus, and this here was in a reference that had nothing to do with tinnitus. This has to do, as you see here, with a reference that just appeared in 2016 on the neural basis of the st strategic decision making that appeared in Trends of Neuroscience. So for discussion, I have now shown to you the table EEG ROIs, base brain function imaging, which reflects the functionality of brain, both for connectivity and also for location. The components of the aberrant auditory sensation for tinnitus which were presented by Samjin in 1972 of these components have application. And we're seeing it here in the table distribution of now the Z-scores. We speak of canonical brain function network. That means in the phylogenetic development of the brain, these networks were developed for what purpose? For survival. And we've been speaking about that for a number of years. And these networks are now called the default, the salient, the central executive function networks. We speak also now of large scale core brain function networks, all of which gives to us in the field of tinnitus objectivity in terms of electrical activity in brain, of which we need to now use for our tinnitus research. Next, multiple brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal are what we are now seeing with brain function imaging technologies. Statistically significant standard deviations from normal age based database are seen in our EEG based table of regions of interest that now have been highlighted in our source localization. And here are these canonical brain networks. And we see here then the ventral medial prefrontal cortex right over here. And we see here now the posterior cingulate gyrus and we see here now for the executive action by executive we're talking about that which puts it into ac action and that is here now in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that you see here and also in the posterior parietal that we see here on this image and the authors now have also identified Seeley and Grecius have identified the salient network. What do we mean by a salient network? It means that this individual over time has introduced a particular personal imprint upon what they are now having a thought about and how it influences it. And that is, in my judgment, what makes us individual, what makes us like one thing and someone else doesn't like the other. And these are always ongoing. So when we're now looking at the table of regions of interest, when we're looking at the source localization, we're seeing here a combination, an overlay, if you will, of these networks, the most prominent one of which is highlighted by the regions of interest in its statistical significance. Messalem, in 1990, approached brain function with a question, and that was, up until then, most of us were now being taught and looking at brain function in a modular approach, that a given area had a given function. And we then had the ability of now identifying function by giving the patient a task-oriented activation. And the way the patient responded behaviorally was now, and cognitively, 
was now used to establish the function in that particular module of the brain. But he came and said the following, we need to now have five major core functions in brain. And these five major brain functions has now been now expanded till we speak of networks of neuronal activity, which are large scale core brain networks. They are the following. First, he said, there needs to be an area in brain that processes attention. And that's in the posterior parietal and frontal eye fields. Secondly, language. Wernicke and Broca's areas. Explicit memory, also called declarative memory, which involves a conscious attempt to retrieve memories of past events. Network in the hippocampal entorhinal complex and the inferior parietal cortex. Thirdly, there needs to be an ability to recognize face. That's from the mid-temporal and the temporal polar cortices. Next, we need to have an implicit working long-term memory. It requires little, if any, effort to recall things. And lastly, there needs to be an executive function in the prefrontal and inferior parietal cortices, he postulated, that is, to execute, to enact a particular brain function. When these functions are now in step, there can then be ability of the life form that now we're talking about here, the human in mammals, we need to now keep in mind that this gives to us an ability to survive. That particular sensation, which now it comes as a stimulus, either externally, extraceptive, or within the body, which we call interoceptive. And I recommend that any and all here read this paper in 1990. So what are the implications and questions that now arise? In the past 30 years in the field of tinnitology, the discipline, we have had advances in both ear and brain, both significant to and for each other, and very important to caution, not to forget that our issue is tinnitus, not brain. Yes, brain, to help us understand the way the patient is now producing different brain functions in order to survive in order to deal with the tinnitus symptom, with the tinnitus signal, which is in brain. Remember the work of Papez. Papez who had a diagram for the emotional pathway in brain. And he focused it upon what? He focused it upon the area of the hippocampus. And we now know that is not the area for emotion. We know that that is the area for memory, together with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex, as I've shown, for decision making. So observations and inclusions, conclusions in 2016 may not survive time. We do know that there are clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus. Tinnitus, is it a symptom or is it a disease? Those who now are so focusing on brain say that it is a disease of brain, but not to be forgotten are the experiences we've had that teaches us that tinnitus in 2016 is a symptom having involvement of both ear and brain. So the question then is, it's not a question, is it one or the other? What is it both? And that we'll both have to wait as we do our investigations to find conclusions. Probably there'll be a combination of those types that are predominantly ear, those that are ear and brain, and there may very well be and we think we've identified one such that is essentially, primarily, e brain in location. But all of us face the following problem, and the problem is that of consciousness brain function. What is it? How does a tinnitus patient become alert, aware of this aberrant auditory complaint? What is it that causes fluctuation of intensity? And don't forget we're talking here about a conscious awareness of a change of intensity. And the question is, what are the mechanisms and neuroanatomical locations of this particular issue? So what is the conclusion? Increased tinnitus efficacy in a tinnitus relief plan or treatment can be modeled based on the statistically significant auditory, non-auditory activated regions of interest. The QEG Loretta provides data that clinically provides an objectivity for a subjective aberrant auditory sensation tinnitus in terms of multiple brain functions and auditory non-auditory regions of interest in the presence of the tinnitus signal. Thirdly, 
An electrophysiologic correlate for tinnitus has been identified in brain cortex in terms of multiple brain functions. We started out wanting to identify a tinnitus signal in brain. What we've been taught is we have not done that with this technology. What we have identified is an electrophysiologic correlate in terms of brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal. And lastly, a central component of the clinical type of tinnitus is identified with QEG Loretta. Next, increased tinnitus efficacy in a tinnitus relief paralysis treatment can be modeled based on statistically significant auditory, non-auditory activated regions of interest. The QEG Loretta provides data that clinically provides objectivity for subject of aberrant auditory sensation tinnitus. Not in tinnitus, but in terms of multiple brain functions in auditory and non-auditory regions of interest in the presence of the tinnitus signal. An electrophysiologic component correlate for tinnitus has been identified in brain cortex in terms of multiple brain functions. A central component of the clinical type of tinnitus is identified with QEG Loretta. The clinical course of components of the tinnitus complaint, sensory, affect, psychomotor, memory, all for tinnitus can be modernized with the QEG Loretta. So what's the take home message? All patients with subjective idiopathic tinnitus of the severe, moderate, severe disabling type are recommended to include EEG based function imaging in the tinnitus evaluation protocol. A sensory neural, sensory neuroscience model, SNSN, is recommended for basic science research and clinical evaluation and treatment of tinnitus. The QEG Loretta data of brain structure and function, fundamental to the theory and hierarchical model of brain function, finds translation for tinnitus theory, diagnosis, and treatment. The efficacy of a tinnitus relief program and plan of treatment can be monitored with QEG for tinnitus, and I've shown that to you today. And what about the future? Identification of central clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus, interoceptive in origin with brain function imaging networks has been demonstrated. And we need to also do that not only for interoceptive, which would be new, but also for extraceptive, which we have till now. Secondly, for the future, we look to identification for an object of electrophysiologic correlate of tinnitus intensity. Thirdly, for the development of research and clinical protocols for vertigo using EEG-based brain function imaging networks. We recommend this for inclusion into the International Clinical Protocol on Vestibular Disorders, Dizziness, proposed by Professors Trinas and Clausen. Fourthly, recommend for the future establishment of multiple centers of excellence for sensory disorders with a focus on tinnitus and other abnormal auditory sensations and to start wherever this then is done by the cooperation of ENT and audiology. Have a tech learn how to do EEG recordings. Have an EEG specialist who understands the raw EEG data and then to have a trainee trained in the neurometrics software. Acknowledgements are expressed to Professor Extraordinarius Neurotology Clausen and the Neuroequimetric Society for introduction to the QEG in 1999. Elma Weiler, Klaus Brill, for instruction in the QEG in 2000. To Leslie Pritchett, professor of psychiatry at NYU, chief scientific officer of BrainScope, our mentor and consultant for QEG Loretta. And to the Martha Antimon Tinnitus Research Center, Incorporated, for ongoing support of this educational and research effort. And we have an announcement. Barbara Goldstein and I are pleased to announce a grant for tinnitus basic science and clinical research and tinnitus patient diagnosis and treatment from the Martha Antimon Tinnitus Research Center Incorporated to the University of Miami, Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Fred Talishi, Professor and Chairman for establishment of the Martha Antimon Tinnitus Research Fund, Michael Hoffa, Physician in Charge. Collaborations of existing projects will be allowed to continue and are planned for the future in basic science and clinical medicine for the ultimate benefit of the tinnitus patient. I leave you with the words of William James. Science, like life, feeds on its own decay. New facts burst old rules. The newly divined 
conceptions bind the old and new together into a reconciling law. I thank you.